Do service to Him. Fulfill His inner heart's desire, not yours. Don't come to Him with your agenda. Ask Him, O oh Gurudev, how can I serve you? This is the process of receiving transcendental knowledge. Krishna says, Pariprashnena Seva Upadekshanti Te Gyanam Gyani Nas Tattva Darshi Maha. So the Tattva Darshi means the pure devotee who is fully, fully realized in all Tattva Siddhanta. He has realized the absolute truth. Tasmat Guru Prapadyeta Jigyasu Shreya Uttamam. Shabdi Parecha Nishnatam Brahmani Upasamasrayam. He is fully realized in Shabda Brahma and Para Brahma. He is fully conversant with the transcendental knowledge uh, of all Vedic Siddhanta. And he has realized Para Brahma Krishna. So he is called Tattva Darshi. When we surrender to him, uh, then Jnani Nas Tattva Darshinaha Upadek Shanti Te Jnanam. He will instruct you in that knowledge. And then Krishna says, and when you have received this knowledge from the Tattva Darshi, then you will know that uh, all living beings are in me and that they belong to me. Then you will know this. That all Jiva souls, they are within Krishna and they belong to Him. They are His eternal servants. So we are very fortunate that we have a actual realized soul as our Gurudev. Tattva Darshi. And He is very merciful. He is trying to give His mercy everywhere throughout the world. Today is a day when we will try to highlight and remember how He is giving His mercy, so broadly distribution of His mercy. We have seen in our life the merciful activities of the pure Vaishnavas like Srila Prabhupada. How merciful He came to rescue and save the most fallen. Uh, how He endlessly gave His mercy. Uh, we have seen Srila Bhakti Rakshak Sridhar Maharaj also in old age uh, still giving mercy, giving mercy, f fully giving his Harikata. And now we are witnessing Srila Gurudev, Srila Bhakti Vedanta Narayan Maharaj uh, at every single step, year after year after year, despite any personal inconvenience, continues to travel whole world. Hmm? to continue to shower His mercy on everyone. So this is a day, Vyas Puja day, when we should come to Sri Guru in a very submissive mood and beg for His mercy. What kind of mercy? Not, don't make the mistake to come and ask for something mundane. Don't. Uh, don't relate with Guru in that way, especially on this day. Understand who He is, what He's come to give, and beg for that. Hmm? Then your Vyas Puja, your worship of Sri Guru on this day, it will be successful. Hmm? I want to speak a, just a little bit. Our time is not so long today. We had an idea that we would have started at 7.30, but, uh, and Guru Day will be coming at 10. Now it is... Uh, almost 20 minutes to 9. So I want to speak about 10 more minutes and tell a few things about Srila Gurudev. Then I want to turn the mic over to Srimati Shamarani Didi uh, and hear about Srila Gurudev. So, at different times I've told a little bit about Srila Gurudev's glorious preaching activities. And sometimes devotees who heard that, or heard that I told about it, they wanted to, they asked me to tell. Because I told the story 
of Srila Gurudev's first tour, his first uh, Western tour, and how he was executing that preaching activity. It's a very wonderful story of the, for those of us who were there able to witness. And when we recall how Srila Gurudev conquered everywhere that he went uh, and stole everyone's heart. So in brief, I'm just going to tell that, condense it into ten minutes. Uh, so you know that when I first had the chance to come to Srila Gurudev's Lotus Feet, um, I met him in 1988, 20 years ago. But I saw him uh, ten years before that in Srila Prabhupada's final days in Vrindavan. I was there. I was fortunate to witness Srila Gurudev's uh, placing of Srila Prabhupada in Samadhi. And actually, I want to tell you the story of when I first saw Srila Gurudev. It was on that very evening. I had heard the name of Narayan Maharaj because we were there for some weeks before Prabhupada's disappearance. And we heard that Srila Prabhupada had, had uh, requested that this personality, Narayan Maharaj, should come and do his samadhi. But uh, I didn't know who he was. But naturally we assumed that he was certainly a very favorable uh, god brother or something like that from Gaudiamat. And uh, then uh, as the days went by, I began to hear that Oh, he's a disciple of Prabhupada's sannyas guru. Uh, so then, when that day finally came, on Srila Prabhupada's evening of his uh, Aprakat Lila, his, uh, his unmanifest Lila, Nitya Lila. So then, uh, when we brought Srila Prabhupada on circumambulation of the temple, his transcendental body. And we brought him into the temple room and placed him on the Vyasa Sun. And this was to be the very first Guru Puja of Prabhupada after he had departed. So you can imagine the emotions of all the disciples at that moment. Um, so a Guru Puja began, and there was one personality who was leading that kirtan. And as I began to hear the singing of that personality, uh, I looked over, who is this? And I saw this very effulgent sannyasi, little elderly. And I thought, who is this person? And as he kept singing, uh, the uh, I think Sri Guru Charana Padma, perhaps. And at the end of that, he was again and again singing Jaya Prabhupada, Jaya Prabhupada, Jaya Prabhupada. And I was very struck by his moods. So I asked one of my godbrothers, who, who is that Sanyasi singing? He's, and he said, oh, that's uh, Bhaktivedanta Narayan Maharaj from Mathura. I said, oh, that's Narayan Maharaj. And I took note. So, as the evening progressed, we all sat in the temple room all night long, uh, many, many hours through the night till the early dawn. And all night long, the kirtan was continuing. One of Srila Prabhupada's godbrothers was also there, uh, Srila Akinshana Krishna Das Babaji Maharaj who was very dear to Prabhupada and also was there doing kirtan when Prabhupada took sannyas. So Prabhupada took sannyas and Srila Narayan Maharaj was his priest who was performing the yajna and the kirtaniya was Krishadas Babaji. And now, same two personalities are there for his disappearance kirtan. And I was sitting just behind them. So I was watching and observing and then in the morning, when we uh, continued and went on Parikrama throughout Vrindavan, then I watched Sri Lanarai Maharaj as he was walking next to Prabhupada's palanquin. Very grave, very deep personality. Uh, 
who is this personality? I was very attracted to him. Spontaneously, I was attracted to him, but I didn't know anything about him. Even at that time, I didn't know about the conversation which he had had in Prabhupada's room, which we've all heard many times that Gurudev has told what Prabhupada requested of him. So I didn't know at that time. And so then after that, many years went by. And finally, I had the chance to meet personally Srila Narayan Maharaj because in 1988, I went to India and on the request of a godbrother who has already become a servant of Srila Gurudev, that's my godbrother Pran Kishore Prabhu, he was sending money from America to build the Rupsanatan temple in Vrindavan, Seva Kunj. So he, they needed he and Uddhava Prabhu. Uddhava Prabhu now has this Vraja Kunj restoration project. So the two of them, they collected to build the entire temple. So I was sent by them to bring a donation because in those days you couldn't send through the banks. So I physically brought it to Srila Gurudev and it was my first opportunity to meet him. And um, I could only stay three days because I was only able to stay in India for two weeks. And the rest of the time I wanted to go to Navadvip to see my other Sikh Guru, Srila Bhakti Rakshak Sridhar Maharaj, who is still living on the planet. And then uh, when I came there to the Kesha Jigodi Mat, then I presented the donation to Srila Gurudev and read a letter to him from Pran Kishore. And then I, I said, then he asked me, he said, so how long you will be with us? And I said, well, I can stay for three days. Acha, so tomorrow we are going to Radhakund and Govardhan. You will come? He said, yes, yes. <laughs> My good fortune that they already had a parikrama, which was planned to go. And they had a small bus waiting the next morning. So I went, I was the only Westerner, and I went on the parikrama with Gurudev. Not walking, it was just a bus tour. And we took prasadam together at this Giriraj temple near Radhakund. And I sat next to Gurudev and was able to take some of his remnants. I didn't know who he was at that time. I didn't know. I, I, I remember when he got on the bus, it was one of these rickety old Indian buses where they have the side seat facing the driver, you know. And uh, I sat there and then Gurudev came on at the end and he just sat down next to me and pulled his charter over his head like this, had his hand in his feet back, and the whole way he was completely absorbed as we're bumping and along the roadside. And I was just thinking, who is this person sitting next to me? How exalted he is. He must be at least as elevated as the ISKCON gurus. At that time I was thinking, I had already actually left ISKCON and that's a whole nother story. But, I, you know, I thought, well, he must be even far superior to them in terms of his transcendental advancement in Krishna Bhakti, you know, so no doubt. And, but I, here he is sitting here on this bus with me with no prestige. All the other gurus, they need big, expensive Mercedes Benz cars and all that. But here he is, he's just sitting here with no, no kind of uh, pratishta, Asha. That, is, that impressed me very much. How simple. How simple and pure. The next day, I went to Vrindavan and took photos to bring back to America of the temple, the construction that was going on then. And Madhav Maharaj, who is Naveen Krishna Brahmachari, took me there on the bus. And immediately I felt such a warm affection with him. Immediately. He's such a friendly person he was. Uh, and uh, then that evening, or Either that evening or the next day, I had requested to take photos of Srila Gurudev that I could bring back to America. So Gurudev agreed to pose, and he sat up on the rooftop, and we put a table in front of him with Shastra and Tulsis on both sides, and he was sitting there posing, you know. In those days, Gurudev had these dark rimmed glasses. <laughs> so old photos of Gurudev. I don't know where they are now. And... Uh, then the, on the third day, I was on my final day, and I, one, I requested to have a darshan and ask some questions to Gurudev. So I was able to speak with him. 
And that was really my first time, you know, to have a personal exchange like that. Uh, and I could see that he was very interested in me. He was very interested. I could feel that. He was very interested to help me in my spiritual life. But at the same time, you know, there was no pressure, you know, just very friendly, very encouraging, answering my questions very patiently. And I remember uh, thinking after that first meeting with him, oh, I've met a person who I can now go to in the future, you know, who can be a guide for me, who can help me in my spiritual life. At that time, Srila Sridhar Maharaj was still living, but uh, he happened to pass away that same year, some months later, in 1988. And so then I began to think, yes, Srila Narayan Maharaj, he, I can get Sadhu Sangha from him. Because at least I understood this much from the early days of my study of Srila Prabhupada's books and hearing him and then Srila Sridhar Maharaj, I understood that sadhu sangha sadhu sangha sarva shastra koi lava matra sadhu sangha sarva siddhi koi that's one thing I got if I didn't understand anything else I understood that that I better try to get sadhu sangha as much as I can with as highly elevated devotees as I can so Krishna arranged very kindly very kindly he arranged and then uh, some years went by and I was more associating with Pran Kishore, who was very devoted to Srila Gurudev right from the very beginning. And I also now started feeling some relationship with him, but we're living in America, and some years went by, I didn't see him again. But one time he wrote me a letter. I wrote him a letter in my early 90s, and he wrote back, and he said, Oh, those of you who have left this gun, you disciples of Swami Bhaktivedanta, you should, you should combine together and you should go on preaching in the line of A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Maharaj as ordered by Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Prabhupada. So I thought, oh, he is giving me some mandate here, uh, some direction. And then on another letter, some a couple of years later, it was around 92 or so, and he wrote again and he said, Oh, you should help the devotees. There are so many devotees that need so much help. So I started to feel like, you know, Srila Gurudev was inviting me, recruiting me in his mission. But his mission hadn't manifested yet, you see. So then, around 1992 or 93, there was the first... Uh, book of Gurudev's called The Nectar of Govinda Leela, huh? which was published. It wasn't yet published, it was just manuscript form. And it was the first book of Gurudev's in English that was translated from his Hindi lectures. See, So actually I really never got the chance to hear Srila Gurudev's lecturing up to that point, even though I'd met him. But when he was lecturing at that time it was in Hindi and I couldn't follow. So, uh, when, this, when this manuscript came to me, I began to read it one day. And as I was reading, I began to become astonished. Who is this personality? What is he expressing here? This is amazing. I couldn't believe it, actually. What he is giving. The flow of his Harikata. How Rasik. How absorbed in Braj mood, and how perfectly he's distributing this knowledge. It touched me very, very deeply. And I began to feel, oh, just like Srila Prabhupada's books, Srila Sridhar Maharaj's books, how they went into my heart. I'm experiencing the same thing now from this personality. And then at that moment, I began to realize, oh, Krishna. You're coming to me again as Siksha Guru. And I paid my obeisances to that book. And uh, so then I made the determination that I would come to Srila Gurudev in this life. And it took a little time, but then in 1994, 
I was able to go to India and be with him there on Braj Mandala Prakrama, my first time for two months. And uh, that was a life-changing experience. Couldn't go back after that. After that, no way to return back to what my life circumstances were at the time. Now I understood uh, I have to be with him. I have to serve him. I have to try to really connect with him. I was fully convinced by going with him for two months, I was fully convinced he's Mahabhagavat. As I was walking along one day on that first parikrama through the fields near Nandagaon with Srila Gurudev off in the front and I'm walking behind, I'm looking at him and I was thinking, oh my God, how fortunate I am. How did I end up here? And then I thought, there are so many devotees around the world who have come to the Krishna Consciousness Movement in later years after the disappearance of Prabhupada. So they never got to meet Srila Prabhupada. They never got to experience what it was like to be in the personal presence of Srila Prabhupada. But yet they have so much attachment to Prabhupada through his books and everything. They've developed a relationship with him. But there's a place inside of their hearts that they lament. Oh, I wasn't there when Prabhupada was on the planet. I'm so unfortunate I didn't get to have his darshan. And I was thinking that those persons all throughout the world who feel this way, who feel this lamentation in their heart, if they could be here right now on this Parikrama, this Braj Mandala Parikrama with Srila Narayan Maharaj, that desire to be with Prabhupada would be completely 100% fulfilled in their heart. Hmm? Yes. And then we had no idea that Srila Gurudev would begin a worldwide preaching mission, you know. He was just a hidden Rasik Vaishnava in Vrindavan. Of course, the ISKCON leaders were coming to him at that time. And then at that same exact time, they also uh, turned against and made the fateful criminal mistake of banning a pure devotee from associating with all the devotees and giving his mercy, which Prabhupada wanted him to do. So I'm just ending now. I, I didn't really get time in this short to tell the whole story of Gurudev's first tour, but I just want to say how it began, because maybe I'll do another class sometime and can hear the rest of the story. But Srila Gurudev, I was with him during 94, 95, and then in early 96, or also during that time, my god brother and, and I came to Malaysia and we met all the Gaur Govindamara's disciples there, Raghava Pandit, Gokul, and a few others, Jagadish, Prabhu, and Ananta. Dhamanar Maharaj, yeah, he was there also. Bhakta Rath. <laughs> so, so suddenly Krishna was just arranging, you know, that we were introducing them to Srila Gurudev, and they were introducing us to Gaur Govinda Maharaj, who we really hadn't met before. And it was just immediate, there was an understanding that, yes, this is the same line. This is, this is where it is, you know. But, but to my and every, the whole world's astonishment, Srila Gaur Govinda Maharaj performed his Nitya Leela the, the very next year. And it was at that point that I was thinking, oh, how wonderful. There's a pure Vaishnava on the planet in Iskand. Oh, good, good. So maybe they can be rectified from within. Oh, I should go and get his darshan. I should go and, and hear from him. But just at that moment, I was in Taiwan. And I received a phone call from Pran Kishore, and he said, there's some very heavy news. You're not going to believe it. I said, what? He said, a great Vaishnava has left the planet. Who? Srila Gaur Govinda Maharaj. He said, no, you're kidding. And a few moments of silence. And then he said, but I also have some very, very good news. Srila Gurudev is going to the West. I said, he is. When is he going? Oh. He said, he's going in April, right after Gaur Purnima. I says, I'm going, I'm going with him, I'm going with him. And this was the most wonderful event. Hmm? So he had always thought uh, that if Srila Gurudev could come,
And then so many devotees, uh, and they could get his mercy. Finish here. Jean Rani, did you come? come. After. Magyanam Timiran Dasya Gyananjana Salakaya Chaksuran Militam Yena Tasmai Sri Guruve Nama Guruve Guru Chandraya Radhikaya Tudalai Krishnaya Krishna Bhaktaya Tadabhaktaya Namo Nama Yang Pravrajanta Manupeta Mapeta Kristyam Dwai Paya Novya Hakatarawa Juhava Putre Titan Mayataya Tarawa Ubanedus Tang Sarva Bhuta Hridaya Muni Manatosmi Bhaktiavahinaya Parada Lakshay Chirtasya Kamadita Ranga Madhye Kripamaye Tvam Charanam Prapadyam Vrindai Namaste Charanaravindam Tavoy Vasmi Tavoy Vasmi Najivami Tvam Vina Iti Vigyaya Radhe Tam Nayamam Charanam Tike First, I offer my unlimited obeisances in the dust at the lotus feet of my most worshipable Dukshu Gurudev, Nichilila Pravishta Om Vishnu Pai, Astodhira Satashri Srimad Shala Bhakti Vedanta, Swami Prabhupada, and the same unlimited obeisances in the dust of the lotus feet of my most worshipable Shikshu Gurudev, Om Vishnu Pai, Astodhira Satashri Srimad Shala Bhakti Vedanta, Narayan Goswami Maharaj. To all of our disciplic succession and all the assembled devotees. Um, I'm just exactly the opposite of Sri Pad Padmanabh Maharaj. You'll never see a tear in my eye. But I can just share with you in a very, with my dry, nothing uh, Guru Nista, no Guru Nista, I can share some remembrances. Uh, Sri Pad Padmanabh Maharaj mentioned the first tour, so I'll just very, very briefly uh, share a couple of things Gurudev said about that. Uh, he went on the first tour in um, 1996 and he took us to all the different places that our Srila Prabhupada had been to. And in each place, in each city, he said, I'm going around the world for three reasons. One is to um, see all the uh, places that our Srila Prabhupada made into holy places, Maha 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 Tirthas, and to take the dust from those places and to um, water the various kinds of uh, seeds that Srila Prabhupada planted. Some were still in their seedling stage, that is, seeds means souls. Souls that were still in their seedling stage that Srila Prabhupada had planted. Then there are some that were 
budding, but hadn't turned into flowers, and there were some that were just shriveled up and wilting. But all those kinds, he said, I came to water. Said I came to encourage all the senior devotees that were mistreated and uh, not respected and kicked out from ISKCON, and I want to give them new life. And the third reason is that I want I I have the order from him to continue his mission. In other words, without saying the words, I'm his successor and I'm continuing the mission. Of course, later on in uh, Mawilambar, actually, two times ago, not last time, but two times ago, when he was speaking at the T Steiner Center, he said, he is Bhaktivedanta, I am Bhaktivedanta. There is no other successor to him but me. So, during that first tour, as um, Sri Padpavanava Maharaj mentioned, um, because those um, Iskand Sanyasi gurus uh, who were previously coming and seeing Guru Dev and asking so many questions, and it was really great because Srila Guru Dev um, uh, utilized his conversations with them to produce so many beautiful books like Venu Geet and uh, Gopi Geet and uh, Jaiva Dharma came out in. Uh, as manuscript form, so many questions and answers that are now on Pure Bhakti TV. So it was a wonderful time, and we're all benefiting from that time. They asked such marvelous questions that I couldn't even imagine. And during that time, uh, Gurudev would never take a higher seat than them. Whenever I was there and they were there, Gurudev, if they were sitting on the floor, Gurudev sat on the floor. If they offered their obeisances to him, he offered their obeisances, his obeisances back to them. And if he was sitting on his bed, then he would make sure that any of his servants brought chairs for them. But because he's Tri Kalagyan, he knows past, present, and future, he knew what would be happening in the future, and still he acted in that way. And when they were getting criticized from others for uh, following him, he would glorify them in big assemblies. But then, when they um, started sending out um, fax, faxes and um, messages all throughout ISKCON that Gurudev is against Prabhupada, then he started, then he was able, he was now free to um, preach without any compromise explaining what are the qualities of the real guru, and if someone is acting like a guru, as Gurudev said last night, somebody should really be a sage. He shouldn't be just in the dress of a sage. But at the same time, he was saying, if someone is acting as Acharya, but he's against the real Acharya, don't criticize him, because, because he was bringing the whole philosophy to light. You know, you read everything in the books, you hear it in the classes, but he was bringing it to life because now there was a real life situation. He said, don't criticize them because if you criticize them, then all their qualities, even if you're right, even if someone has criticized your guru and he's a real terrible person and really against bhakti and doing nothing but bringing others against bhakti by forbidding them to go and see the pure devotee, still don't criticize them as a person criticize what they're saying and defeat what they're saying with sound philosophy. So everything was coming to life. He would say, don't criticize, but don't associate. Offer obeisances to them from afar. But that doesn't mean offer obeisances to them from afar. It means don't think about them. Because if you think about them, you'll start criticizing them. And if you start criticizing them, then all of their qualities will come into you. Then, sometimes I was sitting near him at the airport or other occasions, and he was saying things like, these people, these unfortunate people who are doing this, they don't realize what they're doing. And he would pretend that he had a saw, you know, those big saws. And he would go like that on his leg as he was sitting uh, at the airport, and he was saying, he would say, they're cutting off their own thighs. And then he would say things like, 
Krishna is very worried because Krishna has made so many hellish planets, but he hasn't made one that was quite fitting enough for those who, in the dress of acharyas, they criticize the real acharyas and forbid others to see the acharyas. Then, uh, during that first tour, he went to the manor, Bhaktivedanta Manor, and um, they allowed him to do Guru Puja, but then, because they had a, um, like a, I don't know what you call it, something that they sent out to all the different temples, here's how you should be when Narayan Maharaj comes into your city. If you at all let him into the temple, then... You should allow him to do Guru Puj, Puja, but then make sure he doesn't give any class and very, you know, honorably escort him out of the temple room. So at Bhaktivedanta Manor, this is exactly what happened. So they escorted him uh, upstairs while somebody else was sitting on the Vyasasana and, or on the Asana, we won't exactly call it the Vyasasana, but they were sitting on an Asana and just about to give class and went like that to Gurudev as he was leaving and being escorted up to Srila Gurudev's, um, uh, to, I'm sorry, to Srila Prabhupada's museum where there was all the very beautiful paraphernalia from when Gurudev Prabhupada was there. So he came there and of course all of us who had come with him, maybe 20 or so of us, of his followers, and then many of the uh, devotees who were from the Iskon Temple, they also came up with us upstairs to Prabhupada's um, rooms, uh, the museum and Prabhupada's quarters, actually, it was. And um, so there was about 50, 60, 70 devotees standing around Prabhupada as the Iskon uh, sannyasi was showing Gurudev Prabhupada's different paraphernalia. There's his bed, there's this, there's that. And then all of a sudden, because they wouldn't bring him a chair, because then he might start to speak. So in the standing position, with about 70 devotees surrounding him, he started telling him all of, telling us all of his pastimes with Srila Prabhupada, and how Prabhupada gave a standing up class, how Prabhupada would um, uh, called him at the end of his manifest day, and you all know this, so I don't have to get into the details, but he told that whole pastime right there standing up, how Prabhupada called for him when Gurudev was in Mathura and Prabhupada was at Krishna Balaram Mandir in uh, Vrindavan. He called for Gurudev, he told the disciples to bring Gurudev a chair. Gurudev, he actually, he wanted Gurudev to sit on his bed. Gurudev said, I can't, you're my Shiksha Guru. So he called over to have a chair brought, and he sat Gurudev's in the chair, he put Gurudev's hand in his own hand, and he started weeping. He said, I couldn't train them fully due to their lack of adhikari, so now I want you to continue what I've started with them. So Gurudev spoke for a half hour very beautifully. Then, uh, before that time, in 1993, when um, everything was one in harmony, and the Iskan Gurus were uh, listening to Gurudev and trying to stealthily bring in his message into their uh, ISKCON classes, they invited him to speak in 1993 at the uh, Juhu Beach Temple in Prabhupada's quarters there, where Prabhupada spent quite a lot of time. And uh, they asked Gurudev to speak about uh, Viraha, the mood of separation. So Gurudev began to tell about the time that um, he gave Srila Prabhupada Samadhi. Sri Padma Maharaj mentioned that, wow, he's so lucky. You can see why he's so advanced. He was there even when um, Gurudev was leading the whole Kirtan procession and telling the devotees um, how to make the Viraha Mahotsav and how to put Prabhupada's uh, divine form in that palaquin and carry it throughout Vrindavan, and Gurudev was arranging on Prabhupada's order to give donations to all the different major temples of Vrindavan. So Gurudev was relating that in the Juhu Beach Temple, and he said, Prabhupada ordered me 
to give him samadhi. So what is samadhi? Nobody knew what is the word samadhi except trans. So he said samadhi means sama d. Sama means the same and d means intelligence. So our Prabhupada was entering into the same intelligence or the same mood as the um, maidservants of his worshipable deity, Srimati Radhika. And Gurudev explained at that time that uh, on his order, just as I did for my own Gurudev, I put on uh, Sindor and um, I wrote different mantras on his body. I put sandalwood paste on his body as decorating him for going to meet his Isidati and also all the associates who he's one with in intelligence. And although the sannyasis asked Gurudev, can you tell us what those mantras were? He said, no, I cannot tell. And then they asked him later in private when the big, uh, like there were 200 devotees there when he was giving the general class, they asked him in private, can you tell us? And he said, no, I cannot tell. So there were just a few of uh, those memories that were reminded of me by uh, Maharaj's talk. So I'll also share the first time that uh, I spoke with Gurudev. I had seen him the year before at Srila Prabhupada's sannyas ceremony in Mathura because every year Gurudev would speak about his glories on his sannyas day speak about how Prabhupada took sannyas, speak about his um, divinity, and he would have so many other sannyasis also glorifying Prabhupada. So due to my lack of adhikari, I couldn't appreciate Gurudev enough to come to him that first year, but the seed was planted. So that the um, next year, when my god sister asked me, I was only in Vrindavan for just a few days the next year, and she asked me, would you like to see a Mahapurush? So I didn't, even though I'd been reading Prabhupada's books for 26 years by then, I didn't know what a Mahapurush was. I said, well, okay, sure. So she brought me to see Srila Gurudev in Vrindavan. And as usual, his uh, Vyasasana, he, of course, he had a Vyasasana in the temple room. But what he sat on was his bed, office, Vyasasana, uh, in his room in Vrindavan. So, um, I was introduced to him by my god sister as a world preacher because I used to go to the different countries and preach on behalf of Srila Prabhupada. But for about six months to a year before I met Gurudev, I think this was after the first seed was planted when I first met him, but I thought he was nice, but not someone that I could surrender to because. In fact, in that first year that I saw Gurudev, when he spoke at Prabhupada's sannyas ceremony, um, somebody asked me if I, that same devotee asked me if I wanted to meet him, and I said, no, I'm fully satisfied with Prabhupada, without understanding that I had no idea who Prabhupada was. So then the next year, when I did uh, come to see him, because he had planted the seed, and during that whole year, I started lamenting and praying to Prabhupada that, I'm giving so many lectures on your behalf, but I don't understand a word that I'm saying. It's just a combination of syllables. I have no feeling, no experience, no understanding. So when I met Gurudev in those first few days, I uh, expressed this to him, that I have intellectual understanding of the philosophy. And I was proud that I had intellectual understanding of the philosophy. But, and I go around the world preaching, but I have no um, experience or feeling. So I thought he was going to say, well, inter intellectual understanding is not full understanding, which I already knew. But instead he said, intellectual understanding is no understanding. So that really shocked me. And then he said, just like, suppose I say that he started uh, saying the prayer of Prabodhananda Saraswati Thakur. Um, uh, no, Yasha. Yasha, Yasha, Kadansha, Vasananchali, Kailanoti, Danyati, Danya, Pavanena, Kritartamani. That prayer he was saying that uh, Krishna left Radharani, but then he was feeling so much separation uh, that 
he couldn't bear to live without her. So the heir, who's a servant of Radharani, took her fragrance from underneath her veil and uh, brought it across Radhakund into Krishna's nostrils. And then he felt her presence and he felt that he got back his life. So Gurudev said, when you hear these things, or when you hear that Radharani and Krishna are walking through the forest of Vrindavan, what do you think with your intellectual understanding? You think, oh yeah, I know what that's like. I used to have a boyfriend and we used to walk through the forest. Got it. So you have no understanding when you try to base it on your own experience. Just like if I try to tell you and you haven't had a ras rasagula, I try to tell you about a rasagula. It's the size of a ping pong ball. It's uh, very spongy. It drips down the sides of your mouth. It tastes kind of like a combination of a honey and an apple. And it's really delicious and explodes in your mouth. You would, would you understand anything about a rasagula? If you, can, if you all can try and imagine, if you've never had a rasagula, and it's white also, not to mention. So, these are my first experiences. And he says, oh, so you're, a, you're an international preacher. Can you tell what is, um, uh, what was that? Um, unmotivated devotion. He said, you of course know the, know the verse, Sarve Pungsa Paro Dharma, that is pure devotion means to um, serve the Lord of the senses, who's transcendental to all the senses, without any interruption and without any cause. This alone makes the soul happy. So do you know what uninterrupted service is? So I was thinking of a few things that Prabhupada had said. Then I left it up to him because Prabhupada said, example of unmotivated, of motivated service, then you leave your service. Like the wives of the men who went to the war, First and Second World Wars, uh, they went to the church and they prayed, Oh God, please return my brother, father, son, uh, relative, husband, beloved. And then when God didn't do that, they said, Ah, he's nothing, or there is no God, and they became atheists. I said, That's motivated service. So Gurudev um, gave the example of unmotivated service. He said, Even though Krishna does so many bad things to Srimati Radhika. Instead of her love getting less, it's getting more. She, her love increases. So then if you become a maidservant, he said, you're pursuing Krishna. But if you become a maidservant of Srimati Radhika, then Krishna will pursue you. Then, so I'm getting all kinds of light bulbs about what I had previously heard from Srila Prabhupada, but it never clicked what he was actually trying to say. Then I asked him, because I'd asked so many God brothers that after 26 years I'm realizing that I have no taste in the holy names, like Hare Krishna Krishna, when it's going to be over, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, okay, 16 rounds, great, let's go on to something real now. So I had told so many God brothers, and they would tell me many nice, beautiful verses about the glories of Nam, and great, it's a nice verse, but it didn't do the trick. So now in my first few meetings with Gurudev, I told him, same thing, I've been chanting for 26 years and no feeling. So Gurudev didn't give me any verses. He sat up straight in his bed and he said, if you associate with someone who has taste, then you'll get taste. And I put a light bulb went off, that's what Prabhupada always said. And I was thinking, are you that person? So as Sripad Tamanav Maharaj mentioned, about that Gurudev used to take buses. He used to take buses just like us from Mathura to Vrindavan. And not only that, he used to take the rickety uh, cycle rickshaws also just like one of us. So because he had been giving so much beautiful katan, I started thinking, am I supposed to be surrendering to him? And I was praying to Prabhupada, am I supposed to take shelter of him? Is he the manifestation of you? Are you fully present in him? And I was weeping to Prabhupada and I just couldn't figure it out. So then I thought, I have to go to Mathura and ask him. So I, I was across the street with that same God sister who introduced me to him. I was across the street and there he was running. He, there he was just starting to get on a bus with, um, at that time, uh, Naveen Krishna Prabhu. So I ran, me and her ran at lightning speed 
to catch that bus as the door was closed and we ran from across the street. We just made it on the bus and there were no seats. Gurdev and uh, Madhav Maharaj was on the seats and there was no seats for us. So we sat in the aisle on the floor as the bus was moving and uh, we started asking Gurudev this question. How can I know that Prabhupada wants me to stay in Vrindavan and surrender to you? So Gurudev just said, I have no material desires. I'm just trying to serve him. So just by that, I understood that that was the answer. Then when I finally did uh, decide to stay in Vrindavan and spend some time with him, and he'd been talking a lot about Raghunuga Bhakti, so I thought, okay, let me get a Raghunuga Bhakti schedule from him. So should I chant 32 rounds and read, you know, extra and sing these songs? Well, gee, that sounds so easy. So Gurudev said, you have no idea. Raghunuga Bhakti is lakhs times harder than Vaidhi Bhakti. Then after a while, after um, 1996, when Gurudev was uh, starting to travel around the world, and they were writing so many articles against him, uh, Gurudev uh, began uh, ordering me to write articles, not saying anything bad about the person, but just defeating the philosophy, which Srila Prabhupada had also told us in 1977. He said, if you go too near a porcupine, then it puts out its stickers and it gets stuck and also that terrible odor. So rather than go near the porcupine, don't talk about the person, but only say, what is his philosophy? And then defeat the philosophy. So all that time, whenever we were a little late on an article, Gurudev said, when are you going to have it done, after I die? And so he was pressuring us to make sure they were out and also helping us with the arguments. And then one disciple of Gurudev said, I told Gurudev, I don't think that there should be such articles like this. We should just chant Hare Krishna together with all the devotees, never mind what their philosophical bend is, because the, at least we all have the common denominator of we all chant Hare Krishna, so we should just all love each other. So Gurudev said, if somebody was criticizing your guru, what would you do? You would just smile and show your teeth? No, you have to defend him. You have to defend his integrity. Otherwise, you're not my real disciple. So I'll just share a couple of pastimes with how Gurudev made the paintings, because the time is very short. How Gurudev helped the paintings happen, because you're all familiar with all these paintings here. All the paintings were done under Gurudev's guidance, and a lot of times Gurudev posed for the various personalities in the painting. Like he posed for Radharani in the uh, Radharani and Krishna and the Seva Kunz paintings. My lips are totally sealed and just telling you all the various things that he told me in order to um, get the painting to be done, except I will tell you that when he did first order me to do it, he said, the first thing he said was, can you paint my heart? And then he brought me into the next room where he had hired for 3,000 rupees, he said, some Indian painter to paint it, but it didn't it wasn't really my heart, so can you do it? So the reason I'm not saying I'm, my lips are sealed is that as I was doing the painting, I just followed the same thing I did when I would hear anything from Prabhupada. I would tell everybody, did you hear what Prabhupada just said? Wow, listen to this. And it's because of that that to this day I remember whatever I remember of uh, Prabhupada's pastimes and my exchange with him. So I thought, wow, it's the same thing with Gurudev. So all these intimate things he was telling me, not because of my own qualification, but just because I was the one that was going to do the painting and be his paintbrush. So he had to tell me things, and I kept sharing it. And then Gurudev said, a wonderful thing will happen to you after the painting, after you finish the painting. So I worked so hard, like 15 hours a day, and everything I did didn't look right, and I had to repaint it and repaint it. And then every time I would come in the next day, something else was there in the painting that I hadn't done. So Gurudev was actually making the painting happen. So, and then I would do something else, and then it would be changed the next day. And anyway, so Gurudev made the painting happen. But then, um, just before the painting was finished, I asked him that, why did this painting take five months, and all the ones that I did for the BBT only took about a month? He said, those were done by your will, this one was done by my will, and I had to push my will through your will, and that's why it took so long, because you were resisting. 
So then after the picture was done, now I worked so hard, how do I feel? You know, did I get all these realizations that, pro that Gurudev promised me? No, I'm the same exact person I was before. So then I went to Gurudev, I presented the final painting, and I said, I'm the same as I was before, why? So he said, I told you so many secrets to put in your treasure chest just for you to do the painting, and then you open the treasure chest and let it fly out. Oh my God. So after that, I was very, I thought, I was very discriminating on who I would tell all these things were, uh, things about too. So then uh, I would only tell devotees in Gurudev's Sangha, and I would give classes during Gurudev's festivals about the wonderful things that he told me. And then we made tapes of it, and then I made a transcription of it, and we passed it out to devotees. And then Puru Prabhu, who uh, Gurudev's Shiksha disciple, Prabhupada's disciple, who Gurudev loved so much, uh, you know he has this uh, website, and he asked me if he could put the transcriptions that I made onto his website. So I told him to ask Gurudev, and so he wrote to Gurudev and said, uh, Shamarani's been making all these tapes and transcriptions, so I'm asking you if I can put it on my website. And Gurudev wrote him a letter that she's been doing that. I'm going to have to chastise her. She did very wrong. And then in the airport in Malaysia, he totally smashed me. He said, I told you th those things only so that you could do the painting. And then you just told everybody without discrimination. That was very bad. So I was wondering, because he said, you'll get more benefit. He said, everyone will get benefit, but you should keep this picture in your heart and you'll get the most benefit of anybody. But I didn't get any. And now I'm telling you why. So that was that. So anyway, so he posed for many of the paintings. And so many of the details in the paintings are from him. Even in Manani Radha, you see a dimple on her elbow. That was Gurudev telling me to do that. And he liked the fact that you see her fingers going like that. He said when a girl is angry, she scratches the, the ground and her upsetness and man. And what to speak of Venu Geet, the instructions came from him. Everything is from his sound vibration. He made the picture happen. First he started talking about it. He said, where are the gopis? They look like they're in the forest, don't they? But he said, where are the gopis? They're in their house, and they're singing Gopi Geet. But because they're so much immersed in their songs, they ended up in their songs, in the objects of their songs, in the forest. They're singing about all the other residents of Vrindavan who are more fortunate than them, and they're unfortunate because they have to surrender to Loklabja and uh, Pati Brata and Dharma Pat Patni and so many things like that, uh, surrendering to the Shastric society's rules and regulations, whereas all these more fortunate and more intelligent uh, residents of Vrindavan, like the deer and the cows and the coward boys and the rivers, they all go out and see you without any restrictions. So because they were lamenting so much, feeling so much separation, they ended up there too. So that's why the gopis are there. And um, so then Gurudev said, Balaram is up front because the elder brother is kind of has a, a Vatsalya relationship. So he would be up front, not watching as Krishna and Radharani are stealthily glancing at each other with sidelong glances, but he should be facing back. I don't mind telling you this because it's not like the Seva Kunj one. So then he said, you should put a, a buffalo horn in Balaram's hand. So I said, well, a buffalo horn, isn't that violence that you have to pull the, the horn off the buffalo and then it hurts the buffalo? So he said, no, it's not a real buffalo horn. It's just made of, of leaves, but it's shaped like a buffalo horn, and therefore it's a buffalo horn. So also for Gornatai, Gurudev stood up from his bed and posed with his eyes a certain way. Not only that, he posed for Krishna's horses in the Bhagavad Gita paintings. And I, I kept not getting it right. He was so kind, just like Prabhupada in 1967, allowed, uh, requested me and invited me to paint in his quarters. So in that one very first Malaysian um, festival, Gokul Prabhu was there, was in the devotee's house. It was a, he, Amal Krishna's brother's house. And so Gurudev, uh, invited me, he never invited me again after that, but uh, he invited me to paint on the 
terrace outside the room that he was staying in, me, staying in. So at that time, he kept uh, showing me how the horses would be. He made his eyes very furious, just like Prabhupada used to pose also for Krishna playing the flute and uh, how the dhoti should be. Prabhupada, uh, it's getting too long. Anyway, so Gurudev posed for how the horses should be, and I kept getting it wrong, so we kept posing again and again. Gurudev said the horse's ears should be blue, special shine colored ears. Gurudev posed for Hanuman on the flag and showed which way the, um, the club should be. It shouldn't be up the ballpark, but it should be down. So in so many different frames, some put, Gurudev gave uh, instructions also. Um, it's too much like this, make it like that. Uh, confirming that Krishna should be wearing pink sari and it's very early in the day. And then it was really great uh, to give more inspiration for the painting that I was doing at that time. Um, Gurudev was just about to give his theme of what lectures he was going to give in Mathura before the Kartik. And then Prabhupada Maharaj raised his hand and said, could you please give lectures on Prem Samput? So Gurudev gave these fantastic lectures on Prem Samput, which you can find on um, Pure Bhakti. And now the Prem Samput in English translated for, for, uh, from Gurudev's Hindi was just presented to him last night. So now they're starting to be distributed in Delhi. And those of you who are coming to Navadweep uh, will see them there and then bring them back for your countrymen. So we were painting the Chamatkar Chandrika, which is so somewhere. And Gurudev was saying, you didn't make Krishna's arms right. You should make them tapering just like an elephant. And he got into so much detail. He said, why did you separate Krishna's uh, bracelets when Krishna's in the disguise of a, of a um, Maturavasi singer? Put all the bracelets together. So Gurudev gave so many details out of his causeless mercy. And then he told us to make an art book of all the paintings that we did for him, a big coffee table art book. He said the president of India gave uh, a big award to one Vrindavan painter named Kanai. And so what would he do if he saw your work? So you should do a big uh, table, table, what do you call it, coffee table site art book and give one copy to the president. And then uh, a couple of years later, he said the same thing. And this time he said, I want you to also include uh, the paintings that you did for Prabhupada so that everybody could see how by the two gurus everything is advancing. So then again, just uh, in Kartik this year, he ordered it again. And I said to him, what is the goal? What is the purpose? Because without a purpose you can't have an activity to get there. I said, what's the purpose of this? He said, so that people could see your glories of how you became a great painter. I said, well with that goal, forget it. I'm not going to do the book. So I missed the whole point. The whole point is that this is the glory of Guru, how they can transform a nothing into uh, being a conduit, is that what you call it? For making windows to the spiritual sky when you have a powerful Guru. So Gurudev was relaxing. He had been relaxing when I said, forget it, I'm not going to do the book. He was relaxing on a, one of those bolsters on his bed, Vyasasana office in Govardhan. And then he sat up straight and he said, okay, forget it, don't do it. Don't do the book. I said, okay, I'll do it, I'll do it. <laughs> so I'll, I'll stop here just because it's late, although for any of us it could go on forever. All of you could tell pastimes for hours and hours. What's the Santi? What? Damodar Maharaj is here? Okay, shall we give the floor to Damodar Maharaj? We will give the floor to Damodar Maharaj. Okay, we'll wind it up, and I hope Demodor Maharaj gets another chance because, in his inimitable way, he'll tell so many ecstatic. Oh, he was the biggest Kripapacha of Guru that you've got to hear all the things that he, all the remembrance that he has. And if, and if he doesn't tell you, I'll tell you at some later date about all the things that Demodor Maharaj and Guru did. Shila Guru Dev Ki Jai, Shila Prabhupada Ki Jai. And he's still getting it. Why? Because he's the only one who could take it. I'd be out the door if I had to go through the stuff he went through.
ప్రేమనుంది